الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم Respected Imam, Nazir, brothers and sisters here in Sha'alam in Malaysia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam spoke to us about Dajjal, the false messiah, and gave a description to which we could recognize that Dajjal has a PhD in telling lies. <laughs> He said he comes with a river and a fire. But his river will be a fire. And his fire would be the cool waters of a river. And whoever falls in his river will have his load of sins increased. And whosoever falls in his fire would have his load of sins decreased, indicating that the world in the age of Dajjal would be a world in which things are not going to be what they appear to be. When truth is going to be dressed up like falsehood. <laughs> and falsehood is going to be dressed up like truth. Here in Sha'alam you are already fully aware of what the New Straits Times does not as yet know about. That there are three kinds of lies in the world of the Jah. Someone should explain this to New Straits Times for me please that they are ordinary lies and then they are great lies and then there is 9-11. If you turn to the University of CNN and <laughs> the other one the University of Al Jazeera for your knowledge of Islam then you will hear the lies that when Islam takes control of government, that when Islam becomes a power in the world, they want to rule the world. They want to impose Islam at the point of a sword upon all of mankind. So we have to save the world from the menace of Islam. This is the University of CNN and the University of Al Jazeera. So it is necessary for us to wash this mud away. Truth has come and falsehood has been defeated. In the Latilakanazahuka. Every time the rain falls, the mud of Batil of falsehood will be washed away. Tell that to CNN for me. And so tonight we want to wash the mud away so that the world can hear what is Islam's conception of a world order. 
Do we want to do what the Zionists want to do? Do we want to rule the world from Jerusalem at the point of a bloody Zionist sword? Do we want to wage endless war upon all of mankind so that Israel can rule the world? Is that our mission? That's theirs. They are the ones who want to impose their rule upon all of mankind and call it Pax Judaica. And that's why they want to bring down the United States at this time. So that Pax Americana would go. And Pax Judaica would take over. And Israel would rule the world. But you and I know that Russia will not bend its knee to Israel. And you and I know that while the Chinese in Singapore will go down and kiss Israel's foot, not China, no. So you and I know that there is going to be resistance to Israeli rule over the world. You and I know that the governments which rule over us Muslims, you know where they are, I don't have to tell you. But Russia and China will not bow and submit to Israel. But Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said about Akhiru zaman that you Muslims will make an alliance with Rome. You all know that, don't you? And when you, don't, when you want to know who is Rome, you must go to the Quran. Because the word Rome is in the Quran. And when you do that, the answer is plain and clear. Saudi Arabia can't change it. Qatar can't change it. I said, excuse me. The Zionist Kingdom of Saudi Arabia can't change it. The Zionist state of Qatar cannot change it. No. The answer is that Rome is the Byzantine, Eastern, Christian Empire which had its capital in Constantinople, today called Istanbul. You can't change that. Rome is not. No. It is not the Western European Christians, the Anglo-American Judeo-Christian alliance which has NATO as its military arm. That is not new. That is not Rome. When the Muslims conquered Constantinople, the head of that Christian church called the Patriarch. This way they call the Pope, that one they call the Patriarch. He was the one who made the announcement that our headquarters now shift to Moscow, to Russia. And so, do what you want, you can't get away from it. Rome today is Russia and her allies, Eastern Europe. That's Rome. And whether you like it or whether you don't is irrelevant. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has made the prophecy. He has said that you will make an alliance with Rome. That alliance is already coming into place. I don't know whether the government of Malaysia is aware of it. But Iran is already in alliance with Rome, with Russia. And Pakistan is moving in that direction now. And if Iran is attacked by NATO, by the Zionists, there is going to be civil war in Turkey 
because the Turkish government is committed to being a servant of NATO. And the Turkish people don't like it. Turkey played a dirty role in helping NATO to take over Libya. Turkey is playing a dirty role in attempting to help NATO to take over Syria as well. And the Turkish Muslims don't like that. So there's going to be civil war in Turkey. That civil war will conclude with the conquest of Constantinople, which is a hadith. That aftahan al Constantinia, said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, in akhiru zanad. And when that civil war in Turkey succeeds in driving NATO away, the alliance with Rome will also be there in Turkey. Saudi Arabia, in the meantime, remains an ally of the Zionists. Since this is an event which is to come, the alliance with Rome, tonight Islamic scholarship speaks from Malaysia to explain to the Russian leaders and the Russian scholars to explain to the Chinese leaders, the Chinese scholars, to explain to Greece, to explain to Eastern Europe, to explain to their priests what is Islam's conception of a world of order, so that they would not be deceived by what comes from the University of CNN and what comes from the University of Al Jazeera, the bogus degrees. They must be surprised about this hadith when Putin hears about it, the Russian leader. Because so many of the governments of the Muslim world, they dance to every tune that comes from Washington. And they proclaim, the political parties that become ruling parties, they proclaim our friendship with the United States of America and with Britain and with NATO. And so tonight we want to go to the Quran to say to the Russian leaders and to Chinese leaders what the Quran has to say about those Muslims who are friends of NATO, who joined with NATO to take over Libya, so that Libya has now become a Zionist state, who have joined with NATO to take over Syria, so that Syria can also become a Zionist state. What does the Quran have to say about that? I think it would benefit Russia and China to listen to what the Quran has to say. I don't think our governments care for the Quran. I don't think so. No. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, Ba'da'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. And he says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have faith in Allah, La tattakhidu al-yahuda wal-nasara awliya. Do not take the Jews, do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? No, of course not. That's the wrong methodology <laughs> to take a verse of the Quran in isolation. When you go to the whole Quran, it is plain and clear. Allah could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. Well then, which Jews and which Christians? Don't take them as your friends and allies. The answer is there in the words which follow. Ba'aduhum awliya uba. Ba'aduhum awliya uba. Meaning, do not take such Jews 
and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other ba'aduhum awliya'u ba'd the Quran is anticipating that the time is going to come in the future when there will be a reconciliation between some Jews and some Christians and a Jewish Christian friendship and alliance will emerge when that happens it is those Jews and those Christians not your Jewish neighbor next door or your Christian neighbor next door the Judeo-Christian alliance that one you are prohibited from maintaining friendly ties and being their allies that Judeo-Christian alliance has emerged today and we now recognize it as a Zionist alliance and it seeks to control the world on behalf of the state of Israel. <coughs> the Quran is saying, do not, this is Islam, do not be friends and allies of those Judeo-Christian alliances. What is the price that we will pay? If we do what Saudi Arabia has done, not, not the people of Saudi Arabia, the government. Because the people of Saudi Arabia are increasingly opening their eyes. And they don't like the government at all. What is the price that you will pay? I want the Russians to hear this. I want the Chinese to hear this. What is the price that those Muslims will pay who support the NATO, Judeo-Christian, Anglo-American Zionist Alliance? The Quran says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Whosoever from amongst you turn to them for friendship and alliance, like Saudi Arabia has done, like Qatar has done, like so many others have done, you now belong to them, you've lost your Islam. Inna Allah la yahdil qawm al-ghalimin Surely Allah does not provide guidance for a people whose trademark is zulm, oppression, wickedness. This is the Qur'an. If I am wrong in my interpretation or explanation of the Qur'an, come on and tell me so. Come on and tell me so that I'm wrong. Nobody has done that so far. And so the Russian and the Chinese must know that when you go to the Quran and when you go to Muhammad Islam to find out what is Islam, this is Islam. The one that will reach out for an alliance with Rome, not the one that allies itself with NATO. In fact, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam has spoken and has prophesied their destruction. My understanding, and Allah knows best, is that the Arab Spring is going to lead to the Arab slaughter. Modern Western civilization, which is now being hijacked by the Zionists, has given to the world a conception of an international order with Pax Britannica. You, many of you must have read my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, already. No? Not yet? We, we have it in Bahasa now, it's outside. <laughs> so you have no excuse. <laughs> that they gave us Pax Britannica. 
And then they gave us Pax Americana, which we now have. That is their conception of an international order in which you have one state which rules the world by the hook or by the cook. So Britain became the ruling state. And then the United States of America succeeded Britain and became the ruling state of the world. And no one can challenge that. Does Islam have any conception of wanting to rule the world? Is there anything in the Quran? Is there anything in the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? which leads us to the conclusion that Muslims want to rule the world. That Muslims want to impose an Islamic political and economic dominion over the whole world. So that in the same way that London was the capital of the world and then Washington became the capital, that one day Makkah will become the capital of the world. No, that's not so in Islam. But if you listen to CNN and Al Jazeera, you would know that. In the first place, Islam is a religion. It is built on beliefs. Beliefs in Allah as one God and in Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam as his messenger. That is Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran and I want Russia and China to take note that Allah says in the Quran La ikraha fiddin Surah Al-Baqarah which is Surah number 2 I hope they know that number 2 you can go and check it out that there is no compulsion in religion. The Quran is the supreme authority in Islam, not some mufti in Saudi Arabia. There is no compulsion in religion. And so Islam is not to be enforced upon anyone against his will. So we cannot seek to establish Islamic dominion over mankind when we are not allowed to force belief of Islam upon any human being. In Surah Al-Kaf, you, you don't say Kaf, you say Kafi. Surah Al-Kafi of the Quran, Allah is even more explicit. Say to them that the truth has come from Europe. And mankind has the freedom to choose. You can either choose to accept it or you can choose to reject it. And when you make your choice to reject it, we respect your choice. Does this sound like a people who want to rule the whole world? Not at all. Nor does Islam permit war to spread Islam in the world. That we wage continuous war. We'll establish Islamic bases, like, you know, American bases. There are about 1,000 American bases scattered all over the world. Huh? Are we allowed to wage wars of aggression? Like they have done on Afghanistan? Like they have done on Iraq? Like they want to now do on Iran, which has never attacked the United States? No. Which country has Iran attacked? Huh? But no, you want to wage war on Iran. This is naked aggression. 
And Allah prohibits you. Prohibits you to do what they have been doing. To establish their British and American and Israeli rule over the world at the point of a blood-stained Zionist sword. What then does Islam want in the world? Well, let us begin with Surah Al-A'raf, where Allah says, فَعَدَوْزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اسْتَعِينُوا قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اسْتَعِينُوا بِاللَّهِ وَاسْهِرُوا إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ لِلَّهِ يُبْرِزُهَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And Musa al-Islam said to these people, Seek istarinu, seek help from Allah. Wasir, be patient. Inna al-abda lillah, the earth belongs to Allah. The earth is not controlled from Washington or from London or from Jerusalem. The earth is controlled from the Arsh al Because the earth belongs to Allah. Since the earth belongs to Allah, we turn to Allah to ask Allah what is it that He wants to have on His earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is in Surah to Yunus, وَاللَّهُ يَدْعُوا إِلَى دَارِ السَّلَامِ وَيَهْدِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَكِمٍ And Allah calls, Allah wants the establishment of Dar al-Salam. A world of salam. That's what He wants. What is Salam? Salam is not only peace, Salam is also security. Something they don't have in Guantanamo these days. Salam is peace, Salam is security, and Salam is keeping evil away. This is Surah to Yunus. And so there can be no peace in the world unless there is justice. And since Allah wants us to establish peace in the earth, it is necessary to ensure that there is justice in the earth. Listen to this is Surah Al-Ma'idah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kunu kawwamina lillahi shuhada'i lilqist وَلَا تَجْرِمَنَّ شَنَانُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ O you who have faith, be steadfast in your devotion to Allah, bearing witness to truth, in all equity, all justice, and never let the hatred of any people lead you to the sin of deviating from the standard of justice. Be just, says Allah. This is closer to taqwa. And be forever conscious of Allah, that Allah is aware of all that you do. And so Islam establishes a standard of justice that is unwavering, that is non-discriminatory, 
justice for one is justice for all. It's not just justice for the Malay and injustice for the others as you have in the Zionists. They want justice for the Zionists and be unjust to all the rest of the world. What nonsense. Listen to this verse from, is it Surah Nisa? يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين بالقسط شهداء لله ولو على أنفسكم أو الوالدين والأقربين إن يكن غنيا أو فقيرا فالله أولى بهما فلا تتبعوا الهوى إن تعدلوا أن تعدلوا وإن تل وإن تلقوا أو تعرضوا فإن الله كان بما تعملون خبير Oh you who have faith in Allah سورة النساء Be ever steadfast in upholding equity Being just Bearing witness to the truth for the sake of Allah Even if in being just it goes against your own selves or against your parents or against your family whether the person concerned is rich or whether he is poor Allah's claim takes precedence over either of them do not then follow yet your own desires lest you swerve from justice for if you distort the truth by being unjust. Behold, Allah is aware of all that you do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks again in Surah Al-Ma'idah and says that if you kill even one human being unjustly, it is as though you kill all of man. And if you have saved one human life from unjust death, it is as though you have saved all of mankind. And so Islam establishes a standard of absolute justice in order to be able to establish salam or peace on the earth. So we don't want to become the ruling state. No. We don't want to rule the world, no. We want a world of peace, of security, and therefore a world in which justice will prevail. And so whenever Muslims take control over a territory, they have an obligation in that territory to establish Allah's guidance. To establish Allah's law in that territory. So that Allah's guidance and Allah's law is supreme. That was called, I wonder whether you ever heard of the word. Maybe your grandfather heard it. And since then you've never heard it. Since we now have the Republic of this and the state of that and the kingdom of that, you know? You now have something called Darul Islam. I wonder if Ikhwan al Muslimun in Egypt fighting in elections, take over government in Egypt. I wonder if they ever heard about Darul Islam. And whether Pas in um, Kalantan, also fighting elections. Whether they ever heard about something called Darul Islam? Hmm? I wonder. When you take control over a territory, Muslims, you establish Allah's deen in that territory. Allah is supreme. His law is supreme in that territory. He is sovereign. That is called Darul Islam. The Western world destroyed it. The Zionists destroyed it. 
and they replaced it with something else. A modern state which says that Allah is not Al-Malik anymore. He is not sovereign. This state is now sovereign. Allah's law is no longer the supreme law. He is not anymore Al-Hakam. The law of the state is now supreme. Huh? Allah's authority is no longer supreme. The authority of the state and parliament, that's supreme. This is shirk. Even a schoolboy will recognize this is shirk. This is what they use to replace what Allah gave to us. A political philosophy in which when we took control of territory, we did so in Allah's blessed name. And we established a dominion of peace and of security and of justice in that territory. That is the al Islam. Did we have elections? One man, one vote, one woman, one vote. Did we, for 1350 of our years, did we have elections? In Darul Islam, we did not recognize the individual as the unit of the state. No. Because Allah did not create us as individuals. The Western philosophy says that we are individuals. The state is comprised of individuals. And so the individuals must vote. One man, one vote, one woman, one vote. But that is not Islam. Allah says in the Quran, And this is why our political system was more stable. More stable for a thousand years. Inna khalaqnakum min zakarin wa untha. Surely we created you from a single male and a single female. Surah Al-Hujurat. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا And then we ordain that you emerge as nations and tribes. لِتَعَارَ That your nations and tribes, the differences between nations and tribes, this diversity would function not as a means of causing you to become hostile to each other and compete with each other and be rival, racial rivalry that the Malay is superior to the Chinese and the Chinese is superior to the Indian and all that rubbish. No. Inna akramakum. Inna akramakum inna Allahi Superiority is not based on your race. That's rubbish. Tell it to them. It's rubbish. Not in Islam. Superiority of one over another is based on taqwa. taqwa. And so, in our political system, the state or the polity was not comprised of individuals as they have in the Western system. But in our system, the polity was comprised of different groups, different tribes, different communities. And we didn't have elections, this circus that they call elections, where you can buy people and you can sell them, and you can brainwash them with television, yeah? and you could do all kind of things to win the elections. In our system, the tribe will have a consultation within itself. And the tribe will recognize who are those who have the greatest wisdom, who have the greatest experience, the greatest maturity. And the tribe will give precedence to their views. And so the tribes will have their consultation. The communities will have their consultation. And arising out of this shura, will come the consensus. 
And so we had a political system that delivered stability. Stability. And you can have an empire stretching over thousands and thousands and thousands of miles, embracing so many different kinds of people, and yet it functions so peacefully. This was called the Khilafah, our system. So we are not those fools who go voting in elections for that political system that came from Dajjal. We are a people who long for the return of the Khilafah and return of the Arul Islam. But you cannot have a stable world unless Darul Islam now reaches out to the rest of the world. We reach out to Russia. We reach out to the Chinese leadership. And we say, this is what we stand for. We don't want to rule over you. No. We want that you and I, you and us, should agree that we want a world of salam, of peace, of security, and of keeping evil away. When Russia says, but that's also what we want. So we and the Muslims, we can do business. And the Chinese say, but that is also what we want. We don't want to enforce Chinese rule over the whole world. No. We also want a world of peace and of security and of justice. So then Darul Islam will say to Russia, well then let's put it down in writing. Let us put it down in writing. And that writing, that written contract, or that written agreement between Darul Islam and Russia is now referred to as an ad. An ad, a contract. And as we make these contracts with China, with Russia, with the rest of the world, we now establish a new, a second group. This is Darul Islam, that is now Darul Ahad. So Darul Islam and Darul Ahad together combine to work for the establishment and sustenance of a world of Salah. But Allah says in the Quran, where is the ayah? In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu awfu bil uqud O you who have faith, when you make a contract, when you make an agreement, when you give your word, you must keep your word. So our, our international order that we would build would be an international order not of world government, not of a United Nations organization with a security council and a UN charter. No, sir. Our world order will be one in which there would be bilateral contracts between Darul Islam and every other territory which says we also want to do the same, to have a world of Salam. And they put it down in writing. And we say, once you give your word, you must keep your word. Because we are ordered by Allah in the Quran to keep our word. Do they keep their word? Those who today rule the world, who gave us Pax Britannica, who gave us Pax Americana, can you trust them? Do they ever keep their word? But when the Russian leadership must know, the Chinese leadership must know that the Islam that comes out of the Quran is one in which Muslims are obliged. When you give your word, you must keep your word. Last night in PJ at Surau Muhammadiyah, we looked at the hadith 
of Akhir Zaman in Sahih Bukhari, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam prophesied that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And the people will fight over that goal. And the 999 out of every, sorry, 99 out of every 100 will be killed. Only one will survive. And each one fighting for the goal will say, I wish I am going to be the one who will survive. But he also said that the Muslims must not take from that goal. We interpreted it last night, and you must listen to that lecture which is on YouTube already today. That the mountain stood for a large quantity, and the gold that was going to come from underneath the river was oil. And the oil was called gold because the time was going to come after the discovery of that oil when that oil is going to function in the world financial market as gold. Meaning the oil is going to function as money. And that happened in 1973 when the United States made an agreement with Saudi Arabia and the petrodollar came into being. Before that happened, however, in 1971, the United States, which had given its word in an international treaty and who were obliged under international law to redeem US dollars for gold at $35 an ounce. It's there in the Bretton Woods Accord, it's there in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund. That we pledge the United States of America, we pledge that any country that brings U.S. dollars to us, we will change it and give them gold at $35 an ounce. But that was only window dressing. They never had any intention to stay with us. And when I believe it was France, in 1971, September, brought a large quantity of U.S. dollars and asked for the gold. What did the United States do? This is their conception of an international order. They said, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep it. Islam has a higher standard of morality than that Washington. Islam says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu awfu bil uqood ila akhir al ayah O you who have attained faith Be true to your covenant Be true to your treaty Be true to your word So we now have Darul Islam and we have Darul Ahad and we have the treaties which bind them together to make a world of peace, of security, and of justice. Now what do you do when a, an army comes and attacks you? Accuse you in Afghanistan. You are the ones who attacked America on 9-11. You in Afghanistan, you kept the U.S. For Air Force down on the ground for two hours. So the U.S. Air Force could not go up for these aeroplanes which were hijacked, that you said were hijacked. Afghanistan, you kept the U.S. Air Force on the ground for two hours. You are the ones who planned and executed 9-11. And then the United States attacks Afghanistan. The poorest country in the world. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. This is called aggression. What 
do you do when aggression is committed against you? Do you go to the Security Council of the United Nations and complain? The Zionist dominated Security Council? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers in Surah Al Baqarah and He says, Fight in Allah's cause against those who commit aggression on you. So when they commit aggression on you, as they did in Afghanistan, as they did in Iraq, they said they were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That's why they attacked Iraq. Lies. When they commit aggression against you, Allah says, fight them. Fight those who commit aggression against you. But you must not commit aggression. Allah does not commit aggression. Allah does not love those who commit aggression. So the world of Islam is prohibited from waging aggressive war for any purpose whatsoever. But the world of Islam is obliged to fight against those who commit aggression. That part of the world which commits aggression and we now have to respond and fight them, that is called the Al-Haq because the word for war is hub. If the Security Council of the United Nations says, no, 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 you cannot wage war with our permission, then we say, well, take a look at Surah Al Hajj. In Surah Al Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Permission is granted. Who gave the permission? Allah. Permission is granted to fight. It is given to those against, against whom war is being wrongfully waged. Allah gives you permission to fight security council, you can do nothing. Surely Allah indeed has the power to come to your help when you fight. But that's not all. Then what, one, one more and then we can stop for the azan. Continue. This one is going to surprise you. Darul Har is not only that territory which commits aggression against you, like they did in Afghanistan, that they did in Iraq. Darul Har is something else as well. And I think Russia will be happy to hear this. And China will be happy to hear this. Allah has ordered Muslims to fight to liberate the oppressed. Wherever in the world they may be. Listen to the ayah in Surah An-Nisa. This is Islam's conception of an international order. We mean business. We want to see a world of peace, of salat, which is a world of security and a world of justice. Anywhere on Allah's earth where there is oppression. And we cannot remove the oppression. Then our ultimate, ultimate weapon if we're going to wage war against you to remove the oppression. But the language in this ayah of the Quran, the language, the literary construction, is very revealing. Wama lakum. Wama lakum. Allah is asking the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. What's wrong with you? What has happened to you? 
لا تقاتلون في سبيل الله والمستضعفين من الرجال والنساء والولدان الذين يقولون ربنا اخرجنا من هذه القريه الظالم اهلها وجعل لنا من لدنك وليا وجعل لنا من لدنك نصيرا او ام اخ محمد عليه السلام what's wrong with you why do you not rise up and fight in the cause of Allah fight who fight for those men women and children in Gaza in particular who are mustadafun who are weak who are helpless why don't you not stand up rise up and fight in the cause of these oppressed people who are weak and who are helpless and who are crying and children men women and children and who are crying out Rabbana the cry is coming out of Gaza Rabbana أخرجنا من هذه القرية الظالم أهلها هو رب help us send for us those who will take us out of this land of oppression deliver us from oppression liberate us from oppression and raise for us out of thy grace one who will protect us one who will give us help and so Islam's conception of an international order is wherever on Allah's earth there is wickedness there is oppression there is injustice then the rest of us have a duty to give them a warning. We declare that territory to be Darul Harb. But that does not mean we send the army right away. No. <laughs> when we declare a territory to be Darul Harb, because there is oppression, we then explore and exhaust every possible peaceful means to remove the oppression and only after we have explored and exhausted all possible peaceful means to remove the oppression, only then becoming after it. So we have, we are people who mean business. We want a world free from oppression. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْدَهُمْ بِبَعْدِ If Allah had not ordained this, that some people should rise up against others who are oppressors. What would be the consequence? La fasada til There would be fasad on the earth as there is today. Surah Al-Baqarah. And then in Surah Al-Hajj. وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسِ بَعْدَهُمْ بِبَعْدِ لَهُدِّمَتْ صَوَامِعُ وَبِيعٌ وَصَلَوَاتُ الْمُمَسَاجِ يُذْكَرُ فِيهَا اسْمُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا If Allah had not ordained that this people must rise up against those who are committing aggression, then many of the houses of Allah, and they mention masajid, and they mention other houses of Allah which are not masajid, churches, synagogues, in which Allah's name is mentioned frequently, they will be destroyed. And so Allah has given to us a philosophy of warfare. 
where if we do not fight against oppression, against wickedness, the world is going to be corrupted. But our concept of war has ethics in it. It is not just that we will not fight until we have explored and exhausted all possible peaceful means. It's more than that. There was a book written by the Egyptian jurist, scholar of law, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Abu Zahra, on war and peace in Islam. And I was amazed when in that book I read a hadith. Never read it before. That the Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, I cannot now remember where it came from, Bukhari or Muslim, but it's there in that book written by Sheikh Muhammad Abu Zahra, the Egyptian jurist. That the Prophet said, When you meet the enemy on the battlefield, do not be anxious to start hostilities, fighting. No. And so we are not a people who engage in preemptive pre strikes, preemptive warfare. No, not in this life. Russia and China, I want you to hear this. He says, wait until they start the fighting. And when they start the fighting, wait until they kill one of your men. And when they have killed one of your men and put the body in front of them and ask them, is there no better way for us to solve the problem? Hmm? So Muslims are not a bloodthirsty people, hungry to fight. No, we prefer to resolve the problem peacefully. And only when we cannot resolve the problem peacefully only then would we fight. But even then when we fight, we do not fight unrestricted. There are ethics of warfare. And Allah says in the Quran, listen to the ayah. وَإِن جَحَنُوا لِسِّلْمِ فَجْنَحَ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And when the enemy inclines to peace then you also must do the same and put your trust in Allah for he alone is the one who hears all things and he is alone the one who sees and knows all things and so when we start the fight it is not a fight to the end no we are obliged to stop fighting from the time the enemy inclines to peace. If we had the time, we could have gone on to other parts of the subject. Like when we fight you and we defeat you, then we take your territory. Yes, that's the price that you will pay. When we take your territory, the UN could do what they want. If you are a people with a book, like Christians and Jews, and you want to continue to reside in your territory, which we have now taken over, then we say, yes, you can continue to reside in the territory. We allow you to live. You can live in the houses in which you lived before. But you have to recognize our rule over the territory now. And there is a way through which we get you to recognize Allah has given it in the Quran. حَتَّى يُؤْتَ الْجِزْيَةَ عَنْ يَدٍ وَهُمْ صَاهِرُونَ And that is Surah Al-Tawbah. 
that the Christian and the Jew, the Ahlul Kitab, would continue to write, reside in that territory on the condition that they pay a tax. Everybody pay taxes. What's on your brother? You pay a tax. And this tax is called jizya. You don't pay zakat. We pay zakat. You pay jizya. But you cannot write a check and send it in the mail. No. You cannot send your driver <laughs> with the tax. No. You have to come yourself in person to pay the tax. And you have to pay it hand to hand. And the reason why Allah has ordained that you must do this is so that in the process of paying the jizya by hand and in person, it symbolizes your submission to the rule of Islam in that territory. Hatta yu'tal jizyata an yadin wa hum that you are in a state of subjection to the rule of Islam in this territory. Then there is something called a visa. If I want to enter into Malaysia, I need to get a visa. Hmm? And if the visa is not uh, granted, I can't enter. This is the world today. So how can you enter Darul Islam if you're not a Muslim? If you are a Muslim, no matter where in the world you come from, once you enter into Darul Islam and you say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you are allowed to enter. Try doing that to the immigration and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's called Islam as a state religion. Once you declare La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, it matters not from anywhere in the world you came. Number one, you have the freedom to enter the territory of Darul Islam. The Europeans have that, you know, in the European community. Number two, you have the freedom to reside. You don't need permanent residence. <laughs> Number three, you have the freedom to seek your livelihood if you do need a work permit. No. Number four, you have the right to participate in the shura, the political process. You don't need something called citizenship. But what about if you're not a Muslim and you want to enter the Arab Are you a businessman and you come in to do business? Mashallah, what a wonderful religion this is. It is not the Department of Immigration who should decide whether or not to give you a business visa. Not in Islam. Any Muslim, any Muslim in Darul Islam can grant you an aman, a pass to enter. And once a Muslim gives you that pass, all other Muslims respect it. So no immigration department. What a wonderful religion that every single adult Muslim has the right to grant a pass to any non-Muslim to enter into the territory of Darul Islam. But once he enters into the territory of Darul Islam, this Muslim is responsible for his conduct. When we look at the Islamic conception of an international order, as we have done tonight, we will see that Islam has offered to the world something that is workable, something that makes sense. 
something can bring peace and security and justice to the world, something that can deliver a stable world order, far superior to what the Zionists are now doing when they're about to wage war on Iran, unjust war, unjust war, so that they can establish the Zionist political and economic dominion over the whole world. We pray that the Russian and the Chinese in particular would now understand that this is nonsense, that Islam wants to establish Islamic rule over the whole world. This is rubbish that has come from the Zionists, that we do not have such a thing in Islam. What we want to do is to establish Islam over the territories in which Muslims live and then live in a state of peace with the rest of the world and ensure that nowhere on Allah's earth is there oppression and is there injustice. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين assembly every year called the Hajj, where the whole world of Islam gathers in Makkah, in the Hijaz. Is there any way that we can use this opportunity to further the effort to bring back Islam's conception of an international order? Uh, if you read my book, which is outside, entitled An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World. You will find the Quran and the Ahadith of Nabi Muhammad I'm explaining the world in which we live today as one in which Ya'juj and Ma'juj or Gog and Magog now control power in the world. So long as they control power and they are not destroyed, my opinion is that you cannot restore the Khilafah. The Khilafah, however, will be restored. No one can stop it. It will be restored with the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. And the advent of Imam al-Mahdi is so close now, so close, that some of you here would live to see it. That's how close it is. So we can meet in Makkah, of course we'll have to do it privately because the Saudi police mustn't see us. <laughs> we can meet in Makkah, we can meet in KL, and we can discuss among ourselves. Yes, it is important, it is vital, it is beneficial to have these discussions. Um, but I don't think it is possible to restore the Khilafah until Gog and Magog have been destroyed. This is my view. Uh, what's the name of that organization? Hizbu Tahrir. Defer with me and they believe it's possible for the Khilafah to be restored. And I say, brothers, go ahead and try to restore it if you can, but I don't think it's possible. Any more questions? Yeah. My name is uh, Ajman. Sure, uh, when you talk about uh, the prohibition of Muslims to get your lives in uh, friendship, do you understand that? I didn't say so. Uh, I'm going to say so. Right? Allah says so. Yeah, go ahead. Is it to any business uh, relationship as well? Trade, exchange of goods, because in a way, you might, you know, uh, strengthen the... Uh, Good question. Good question. 
Certainly it means political alliance. A prohibition of political alliance. Certainly. Certainly it implies a prohibition of military alliance. Certainly. Okay? What about economic? Islam never, never recognizes trade as a weapon. Never. Very few people understand that. We have never used trade and business as a weapon. We have never stained Islam with this rubbish of an economic embargo. That's yours. That's your rubbish from Washington and London and Western civilization. The Zionist rubbish of economic embargo. And now a financial embargo on Iran. But not in Islam. In Islam we stand for a free and a fair market around the world. And in that market the Muslim has no advantage over the non-Muslim. The Malay has no advantage over the non-Malay, not in Islam. No. The market in Islam is free and fair. And all people enter into the market equal. Even if you are worshipping idols and stones, you enter into the market on an equal footing with the Muslim. That is our market, a free and a fair market. And so we do not ever impose any kind of a trade embargo, any kind of a financial embargo. So there is no such thing in Islam as an economic alliance. We don't have most favored nation status. No, not in a free and a fair market. Good. Is it possible for Darul Islam to be established before Imam al Mahdi comes? That's the question? Good. No. My opinion, and when I give my opinion, don't accept it. <laughs> Until you're convinced it's correct. I'm just a human being. I can make mistakes. Allah knows best. In order for Darul Islam to be established, you must have Khilafah. You can't have Khilafah while you have the secular state. I wonder whether Kalantan understands that. <laughs> you must first restore Khilafah. And then you can have Darul Islam. And you cannot restore Khilafah so long as they have the power that they have. That Zionist Gog and Magog world order. But Allah is going to destroy them. Read my book which is outside. An Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. And there's also a chapter on Gog and Magog in my book entitled Jerusalem in the Quran, which is in Bahasa as well. Yes? Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Yes, Muhammad Kideh. I have a question. In the lecture, Dr. Dajjal Al-Fawr Musayyah, you have mentioned the, uh, the turning point of the ruling state of the world from the uh, United States to Israel is by the falling of dollar. So, in your opinion, when uh, when it would be the fall of dollar and what is your suggestion to the country that trade with dollar? Thank you. Okay. I'm glad you asked that question because in last night's lecture I forgot one important point. For those of you who were there last night, this is an additional point that I did not mention last night. The question is, if the collapse of the U.S. dollar 
is one of the indicators that power is moving now from the United States to a third ruling state that I say is Israel. When will the US dollar collapse? The US dollar has already collapsed, but it's being kept alive in ICU, intensive care unit, in a hospital in Washington. Meaning it's manipulated. The system is manipulated. They want it to collapse. Oh yes, that's the plan. So that a new money can replace paper money. They don't need paper money anymore. The paper money has already done its job of ripping off mankind and impoverishing the masses around the world. One of the reasons why the United States does not want Israel to attack Iran is because they know that once Iran is attacked, the price of oil is going to, to rise astronomically. What I never understood, and it's so simple, I feel embarrassed now that I didn't understand it is that the price of oil is not rising and falling on the basis of market forces. No. <laughs> the free and the fair market disappeared from the world a long time ago. It is a controlled market that they fix the price. And it is controlled by the Zionists. So they will decide how high they want the price of oil to rise. Mm -hmm. The price of oil has been rising. In 1973, it was maybe about $4 a barrel, $5 a barrel. And then it went to about $8 a barrel, and then $12 a barrel, and 15 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50. While Imran Hussein was sleeping, I'm sorry, I feel embarrassed to say, I was sleeping. I didn't understand. Allah didn't give me the knowledge. No. It took so long for me to understand. Until the price of oil has now reached more than a hundred. That's not by accident. And that has nothing to do with market forces. That is the Zion is fixing the price. The Zion is fixing the price. So when Iran is attacked, I wonder what they're going to fix the prices. Will it be $300 an ounce a barrel? Or will it be $500 a barrel? Huh? And then, in addition, when the US dollar is no longer alive, it's finished now, it's buried, Janaz has been performed away. What's going to be the new money? In the same way that they want one world government, I think it's clear they want one world currency. And that one world currency, one world money, is not going to be dinar and dirham. No. <laughs> It'll be electronic money. It'll be digital money. And so we are on the verge now. On the verge of the movement from one monetary system to a second, to a third monetary system, in which the banking system will now control money around the world. And who controls the banking system? This is not an anti-Semitic statement. The whole world knows it. It is a European Jew. He is the one who controls the banking system around the world. What I missed out last night, when I said that they made a deal with Saudi Arabia, with King Faisal, in 1973, that if the Saudis would agree to sell their oil only for US dollars, and get the rest of the Arab oil producing countries to do the same, 
and then get OPEC to do it as they did, then the United States in return will guarantee Saudi Arabia's security. When King Faisal agreed to that, the nut deal craftily engineered by Henry Kissinger, number one, gave a new life to the US dollar. And so for the next 40 years, the US dollar kept on flying high. And the United States became richer and richer and richer and richer and was able to use all of this new wealth to wage war after war after war after war and yet have more money in the bank to bribe <laughs> and to do all kind of things. We are the ones who allowed it to happen. That's why the Prophet said, don't touch that gold. Number two, that when Saudi Arabia agreed to this deal, it meant that a huge amount of money, increasingly huge sums of money are now going to flow to the Arab oil producing countries. And when they get that money, they can use that money in a manner that Zionists are going to be very pleased about. They will use that money to spread a version of Islam around the world <laughs> that will attack the spiritual heart of this deen. If Imran Hussein is able to deliver the lectures that he is doing, giving now, and it is appreciated around the world, if Imran Hussein has been blessed with the insight to be able to understand and penetrate the reality of the world today, it's because of spiritual insight, not just academic knowledge. And so the heart of the religion is the spiritual life. And once the Saudis got all of that money, they and the rest are able to finance now a different version of Islam that seeks to eliminate the spiritual heart of the deen. That is to the advantage of the Zionists. But more than that, they can now use those US dollars, petrodollars, for blackmail. Because Saudi Arabia is an ally of Israel and an ally of the United States. So we have the money we can give you. All that you have to do is to dance to our tune. That's all. So blackmail. And that's what they've been doing for these last 40 years and they're able to buy governments now in the Muslim world with money. But that's not all. What I forgot to mention last night was as the price of oil kept on rising and rising and rising and rising, it was not just a huge flow of wealth coming to the Arab oil producing countries from the rest of the world of Islam in particular. It was more than that. Because oil plays such an extraordinarily important role in the economy. Transportation is dependent on oil. Agriculture is dependent on oil. Manufacturing is dependent on oil and so many others. What's going to happen as the price of oil goes up? All other prices are going to go up. And as all prices keep on rising, 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 the cost of living is rising, rising, rising. And so the people become poorer and poorer and poorer. And so what the Zionists did was to use our own Muslim people who had joined their camp to enslave the rest of the world of Islam. If Bangladesh today is miserably poor, thank you Saudi Arabia for what you've done. 
if Yemen today is miserably poor. Thank you Saudi Arabia for what you have done. Because that is the price we have paid for the petrodollar. As the petrodollar rose in value, all of the prices keep on rising, cost of living keep on going up, and our people are becoming poorer and poorer. But that's not the most dramatic thing. The most dramatic thing is around the corner. Around the corner. When they're going to fix the price of oil at three and four and five hundred dollars a barrel. That's coming tomorrow. When that happens, what's going to happen to the cost of living? <laughs> what's going to happen to the prices? How much more poverty will there now be in the world? That is a Zionist plan about to unfold. Thank you very much. I think we don't have any questions from the sisters. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters.